Good morning. We're going to open with, this is the day that the Lord has made. And I wish I could have traded places with any one of you. And you could sit up here and watch, watch, you, watch you come in. Uh, first of all, the gathering back there around the peppermint candies was just fabulous this morning. <laughs> and it just may need to be replenished before the end of the service because while they go to children's church, you know, you need to grab another one. So whoever's in charge of that may want to, may want to take care of that. Okay. And then the girls, the preacher's girls were up here showing off their new dresses. I guess they're new dresses. I love them. And you know what? This summer I got in trouble with the pastor and his wife because I told those girls, as long as I'm up here, they are welcome to come up here and dance anytime. <laughs> Can you imagine why I am in trouble with the pastor? I don't know if I still am or not, but anyway, girls, if you'd like to dance, I'm just telling you all, the dance floor is open. This is the day that the Lord has made. Stand with me, please. Just say their name, Charlie and Arlene. One of their favorite songs was Majesty. So we're going to sing that because truly God is majestic 
and they loved him. I know that because they listened to a long time ago, we made a tape, and they listened to that on their way to and from Florida. And they shared this with me, that one of the favorite songs was Majesty. So let's sing and honor God and remember Charlie and our Camp Creek this morning, thank you for coming and being a part of our worship service this morning. We appreciate it, whether you're watching us online, whether you're here, or we'll be watching this recorded. We just thank you for being a part of our service this morning. If you want to take out your bulletins, those of you that are here, let's just look at some of the things that are going on in the life of the church. Um, you know that young lady up there, most of you do anyway, I think. Uh, we were blessed yesterday to join a member to our family, um, Benjamin Spilmer. And so um, as we think about that happening and um, all the things that took place here, we're humbled to be a part of such a great church family. Um, thank you for those that were uh, willing to put the church back together and help doing all the things that it takes to get ready for and clean up after. Um, the service that took place here. Thank you, Brian. Um, but let's just look at some of those things that are taking place in the life of the church. Teens will be meeting next Sunday night um, at the church. Um, you have a slide for offering, Brian. Um, yeah, our tithes and offerings, you can put in the box back there on the round table. They can be sent to the church uh, through the mail or they've been given online and there's uh, our website. Um, You'll notice that Merlin Rain uh, have a new daughter, which arrived on the 30th, last uh, week ago Saturday. There's information about uh, that in the bulletin. Tuesday is Ladies' Aid from 9 to 3, and you'll see what's happening um, there and the projects that they have in store. Ministerial Board will be meeting um, Thursday night at 5.30 here at the church. And then next Sunday is Donut Sunday at 9 o'clock, and we invite you all to come and be a part of that fellowship with us and uh, have a donut while we're doing that. If you have something you'd like Pastor Roger to know about, a request or a prayer concern, if you want to fill out one of those cards that's in the pew in front of you, um, put it in one of the boxes in the back. Um, that will be taken care of. And just a note that Roger will be out of the office on Monday. Um, if you need to get a hold of him, um, you see there that he's Normally here from 9 to 2, and uh, you can phone him, email him, um, 
you just reach out to him through social media. He'd be more than happy to get back in touch with you. Anyone else this morning have anything in the way of an announcement that they would like to share with us? Okay, seeing none. Roger, I'm going to invite you forward. Thank you, Steve. Good morning, church. As we step into a time of prayer and praise, I'm just uh, going to remind you of a couple of prayer requests. Some of them were already mentioned. Just be praying for Ben and Stephanie. Um, as they Were they traveling today? Yes. Um, traveling for their honeymoon and that kind of stuff. So be in prayer for safety, um, as well as just, uh, just the... Praise for the celebration that happened yesterday. Um, and uh, then we um, just praising God for Merle and Rain and their new daughter as well. Um, praying for Connor, as you've seen him kind of limping around a little bit. Just had an accident this week, so just for healing for his uh, foot and the injury there. Um, Jack had mentioned uh, his friend Randy, uh, who has cancer, so we've been praying for him. Uh, yeah. Uh, an update on down to like 123 pounds, mm. and they've got him on uh, morphine and stuff, but his vital signs are really good, and they can't, you know, it's just a matter of time, but it's, they are amazed at how he's been, and he's comfortable, it seems, and everything, but mm -hmm. he was like 170 some pounds, and, wow. but that's the update <laughs> on him, I know, you know, it's, the outlook isn't good, but Mm -hmm. He is, I talked to his daughter a couple days ago, and he seems like he's comfortable, and that's the main okay. thing that we want to pray for, is okay. to be comfortable. Okay. Thank you, Jack. Yeah. Um, and we've been praying for uh, Dee Hart as well and her treatments. Any update on her? Those were the prayer requests I had that we've been talking about. Is there any other additional praises or prayer requests anyone would like to mention this morning? Yeah, Cindy. Roger, I want to add to what Steve said in talking with Stephanie and getting ready for her wedding day yesterday. This was a while back. But the foundation that this church has given to her, you know, it's been 10, 12 years since she's been able to really be back here. And some of you may not know that she's one of the Song Church in Plymouth, but it was really important to her to have a ceremony here, and as she said many times about the foundation that this church has given her. So even those of you that don't know our daughter Stephanie, you know us, and you support us, and I don't want us to um, forget how important it is what we do here, even if we only have people for a short amount of time, the effect that we Thank you for being part of this church. Thank you, Cindy. Anyone else have anything they'd like to mention? Yeah. Um, I had a follow-up MRI last week, mm -hmm. and even though I'm not a radiologist, um, it doesn't really good. Mm -hmm. And so I
spend some time in prayer. Father, we give you thanks this morning. God, we thank you with our hearts. We thank you with our voices this morning of praise. God, we thank you for your steadfast love, for your faithfulness. God, for answering and strengthening us. God, we just praise you for the mighty works you do in our midst. Father, we praise you this morning for uh, just Ben and Stephanie. God, as they uh, were married yesterday, God, for all the details coming together. God, for all the pieces of that, for the celebration that was able to be had of the two becoming one. Father, we thank you for Merle and Rain and their new baby, and God, just pray that you would um, just bless their time, meet the needs that they have. Uh, God, give them rest when they're able to get it. God, just pray that you would help them as they're transitioning to um, just life with a newborn right now and just adapting to that. Father, we thank you for Karen's news of her uh, MRI uh, coming out well and just uh, just the way we've seen you move in her life god the um, removal of the tumor and god just that she feels better now than she has for for some time so god we just thank you for that father we do uh, just lift up the requests we bring them to you we pray for connor connor and just his injury that you would help that to heal father we Pray for Randy as he's um, nearing the, what we see is probably the end of his life, but only you know the days and the details of that, Father. So we just pray that they're able to keep him comfortable, able to meet the needs that he has. Father, we pray for Dee and just pray that she's um, continuing to get her treatment. We thank you that it's been tolerated well. And God, we just pray that you would work in her life for healing there as the treatments are being done god help them to be effective god we pray for um, a good report after the next um, just diagnosis and things that they're doing father we pray for charlie just as he's making this transition to california and God, just as, um, just there's a, a lot of uh, just different needs that we're not even sure of what they're going to be. But God, we know there will be emotional needs. There's going to be mental needs. God, just physical needs, spiritual needs. God, so we pray for each of those, that you would be working in all the details, that you would be helping uh, him as he's transitioning. God, his loved ones as they're transitioning and and just realizing uh, just the space that's between. God, help them connect and find ways to connect in new ways um, and to uh, just be able to continue to build into those relationships, even from a distance. Father, um, we just pray for uh, just with school starting that you would be uh, working in the midst of that. Can I have the teachers, teachers, anybody involved in the school systems, if you would just stand. God, for those that are involved in the school systems, God, I just pray that you would be working in their lives. God, we've gone through a couple of rough years, and God, just pray that you would give them the energy and strength to continue this year. 
God, help them as they're getting plans um, finalized for their first few days. God, getting classrooms ready, getting all the details in place. God, we pray for the administration, that you would be working in their midst as all of the plans are coming together. God, for students, for other things. Could I have the students stand? Any students? God, we pray for these students, that you would be working in their lives, elementary age, high school, junior high. God, for all of them, as they are uh, getting ready to go back to school, and most of them are probably not wanting to go back to school quite yet. They're not feeling like they had much of a summer. God, pray that you would just help them make that transition in their mind. God, give them good attitudes as they go back into the classrooms. God, give them um, just wanting to serve uh, their fellow students and wanting to serve the teachers. God, I, I pray for our communities. God, for the students at, at Triton. God, students at Wani. God, just pray that you would uh, be working in these students' lives to have an effect on those around them. God, we just pray for safety throughout the year. God, we pray for health of all those involved at the schools. God, we pray for the sports. We pray for all the details um, of each day that needs to come into play. And we know that you hold each of those in your hands. So God, we just ask you to work in lives, affect lives, transform lives for your <laughs> honor and glory. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue our worship this morning, we're going to be singing um, Trust and Obey. And there's no doubt in my mind that that is an important part of our lives, as Christian lives. Um, some of you, I don't know if you remember John and Amy Bruni, is it Bruni? They were here for a while, and I know that this was one of their favorite songs. They, they led it a lot, and they liked it. And so I remember them. I'm not sure what they're doing. I think he's still a pastor. So um, we'll think about them, and then we're going to be singing in times like these, and this week has, uh, has brought to light how quickly things can change in the blink of an eye. And um, for Sue's mother's funeral, I know this was a request, that, and I sang this song. In times like these, we certainly need, do need our Savior. So sing with me as we remember those folks.
Kids can go ahead and be dismissed to Children's Church. Thank you, Barb, for leading our music this morning. Really appreciate that, Molly, for playing as well. People say the more time you spend with someone, the more you end up like them. Those of you that have been married a while might have some of those effects. Maybe after time you begin finishing each other's sentences. You begin having some of the same likes, dislikes, those types of things. That's, that's good stuff. What's funny is it's not just limited to human relationships. Sometimes people and their pets have similarities. I want to show you a couple pictures today of some people that began to look like their pets. What's interesting about this one, I don't know if you can see it on the picture up there, but they have the same color eyes. Looking similar, this is the final week of our series, The Heart of the Matter. We've been diving into the way our hearts want to place anything and everything on the throne of our lives besides God. We have been talking about the topic of idolatry. We put idols on that throne in our lives, and we've used Brad Bigney's definition from his book. An idol is anything or anyone that begins to capture our hearts, minds, and affections more than God. It's anything that begins to capture our hearts, minds, and affections that we put on the throne of our lives. You see, our hearts begin to stray away from worshiping God, and we begin to worship other things, things that bring us comfort, things that bring us pleasure. At least this Patrick in her book says this, we have hearts that are torn between the love and worship of God and the love and worship of the world. Our hearts are torn between those things, and you can hear that even in some of Paul's writings. He says, the things I do or the things I don't want to do, but the things I do want to do, I do not do. There's that struggle between worshiping God alone and being pulled by the love and worship of the world. You see, as humans, we were designed and created to worship. We are designed and created to worship something. And your friends, your neighbors, those who aren't Christians, they're all worshiping something. They're all worshipers. It's just what they put on that throne of their lives. So what does it look like? This morning we're talking about delighting in God's presence. What does it look like to delight in God's presence? Because I think as we finalize, as we wrap up the heart of the matter, we've recognized a lot of the difficulties of why we worship idols. We've talked about some of the solutions to that. But a big portion of it is we just need to see God for who he is. We need to recognize him. We need to delight in him. The psalmist talks about this at the very beginning of the psalms. He writes, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his Delight, I underline that word, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. 
He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither and all that he does, he prospers. So the psalmist declares when the person is delighting in the law of the Lord, delighting in the character of who God is, he's like that tree that is flourishing. It's giving fruit off in season. And the leaves are not withering or dying because he's being supplied with what he needs from God. I think Jesus gives us kind of the reinterpretation of this. We, talking about, we talked about abiding. John 15, 5, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing. So those two pictures there of delighting in God have to do with proximity to God. Have to do with location. The psalmist said, it's like one who's planted by the streams of water. Jesus said, if you're abiding in me... If you are the branch that's still attached to the vine, you're going to get your source of nutrients of what you need to grow and to flourish out of that vine. Because if you cut off from the vine, you're going to die. You're going to perish. Your leaves are going to wither, as the psalmist talked about. Lise Fitzpatrick talks about this. In her book, Idols of the Heart, it's in union with Jesus Christ that the one who hung on Golgotha's tree, that we have the desire and power to conquer all our idolatry and bury our gods in the blood-soaked ground beneath his cross. It's in union with Jesus Christ that we have the desire and power to conquer all our idolatry. Why? Because we can't do it apart from him. Apart from him, we can do nothing. We try. We try in our own power. I can do this. If I only make these seven steps, if I do this every morning, if I, if I, if I, what's the problem with that? Apart from him, we can do nothing. This morning, we're going to wrap up our series by looking at a woman in the New Testament who found herself worshiping at Jesus' feet. It's found in the book of Luke, chapter 7. It's verses 36 through 50. I'm going to read it this morning. I invite you to open your Bibles to that passage so you can kind of see what's going on. So one of the Pharisees, who were the Pharisees? They were the, the leaders of the Jewish people. They were kind of the, the lawyers who kept track of the law and all of the details of that, one of the Pharisees asked him, meaning Jesus, to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And Jesus, he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning towards the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased 
to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But who, he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. I want to point out a couple of things quickly. Uh, verse 37, it says, Behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner. Now, are there all different types of sinners in the city? Are they all sinners in the city? So saying that this woman was a sinner meant that she was a known sinner. She did something that was very well known. Many speculate she was probably a prostitute of some sort, something like that. But we don't know that for certain. We just know that whatever she was doing was well known publicly that she was a sinner. I also find it interesting when people in stories like this, verse 39, he saw what happened to Jesus, the Pharisee did, and he said to himself, this is an inward thought. This is not a, I'm muttering it. It says, it's, he said it to himself. If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And then Jesus answered him. I find these things kind of comical, that these are more inward or even maybe whispered thoughts that Jesus wasn't supposed to respond to, but he knows the matters that are going on in the heart. He can see people's reactions. As we look at this story of a woman who is delighting in Jesus, I think we see four outcomes of delighting in God's presence. And as we go through these, I think you'll kind of make the connections of the contrast between delighting in idolatry and delighting in Jesus and God. Four outcomes of delighting in God's presence. The first one is desiring his presence. Why was this woman weeping? I was reading through this this morning, and this wasn't in my original notes, but I wrote down a question. Why was she weeping? What had happened to her? What had Jesus said? One of the commentaries I read said that chron chronologically, this happens after Jesus says in Matthew 11, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We don't know if this was part of the woman's response to Jesus declaring that to a crowd. That then the next day, Jesus, she finds out that he's going to be at this Pharisee's house and she comes. We don't know that, but we can see chronologically how this kind of falls in place. In the book of Philippians Paul writes this, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. We sing the song that echoes the, this verse. And she was finding joy in the presence of Jesus. That's what drew her to him. That was the desire that she felt, was this desire of joy in his presence. Tim Keller says this in his book, Counterfeit Gods, to rejoice is to treasure a thing, to assess its value to you, to reflect on its beauty and importance until your heart rests in it and tastes the sweetness of it. How often do we do that for things that are not God, that are not Jesus Christ being placed on the throne? But she was rejoicing, assessing the value, reflecting on the beauty of who Jesus Christ was in front of her. And her heart was resting in him. 
At this moment, she's laid aside her sinfulness. She's decided she's not going to do that because she's sitting and weeping at Jesus' feet. She found one thing that she was treasuring at this moment that was worthy of her time. At least Fitzpatrick says, learning to take great delight and joy in God is the strongest deterrent to idolatry because you're focused on him rather than yourself, rather than your possessions, rather than the things that are going to make you comfortable. Our hearts are only weaned from our idols by the power of a stronger love, the power of the Father's love for us in the gospel. You see, as we spend time in God's presence, delighting in Him, we desire more to be in His presence presence. It's, it's a cycle that helps us grow and desire him more. The more time we spend with him, we recognize the benefit of that time. We recognize how that feeds us. And much like the psalmist in Psalm 42, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? It's been hot lately. If you spend much time outside, you get thirsty. You come in, you grab that nice cold glass of water, and you take a few sips. Oh, is that refreshing. That's good. The psalmist writes, as the deer is panting for those streams, those cool flowing streams, so my soul pants, thirst, desires for God. For the living God, that desire for what God is doing. So does your heart desire to sit in Jesus' presence? Do you desire to be there with him? The second outcome I see of delighting in God's presence is sacrificing for him sacrificing for him. She brings an expensive bottle of ointment. We don't know how much it was. But it's a flask of ointment that she uses on Jesus' feet. She begins to cry and weep. She wipes off his feet with her hair. How many of you ladies want to do that? Wipe off your husband's feet with your hair. Jack's over here. No. (laughs) No, it's not something we do, but she was so taken by Jesus, recognizing who he was. She begins weeping at his feet. The tears are falling. They're dropping onto Jesus' feet, and she takes her hair, and she begins to rub his feet off. We'll find out details of why that's important. Then she begins to anoint his feet with the flask that she brought. You see, her sacrifice went above and beyond what the host even should have done. What the host should have responded with. But it wasn't those works that saved her. She didn't get saved because she was crying at Jesus' feet. She didn't get saved because she wiped his feet with her hair. She didn't get saved because she anointed his feet with a special ointment. You see, it was her love and faith. Her faith saved her, but her love was an expression of that faith. That it already happened in her life. 
And Jesus responds in the book of Mark. He says this, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And I could say it this way this morning. You're going to love the Lord your God with all your tears and your hair and your ointment. You're going to love him with what you have, who you are. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Her love was an expression of her faith. Elise says this, delighting to do God's will means turning from the deception that joy can be outside obedient fellowship with him. We do that a lot. We think, I'm going to get joy out of this when this is an idol we're placing on the throne. But we're realizing that that deception doesn't bring us joy. She continues, we need to consistently question the imaginations that appear sweeter than God's loving kindness. In order to do this, we'll have to be convinced that his presence is the loveliest treasure there is. We must believe that he'll lavish our lives with joy. That that joy is going to come from him and him alone and not from our possessions. Not from the things that bring us Temporary pleasures, temporary joy, or temporary comforts. You see, idols make promises that they never keep. They never are going to fulfill the hopes and dreams and desires that they say they are going to do. They leave us feeling empty and broken. I have a feeling that whatever her sin was... She was using that to try to fulfill her life. And she recognized at this moment that he was and is the only one who could meet that need in her life. You see, as we're in Jesus' presence... As we're desiring to be in his presence more and more, we're going to recognize the idols we need to lay down, the idols we need to let go, the sacrifice we need to make for something better, for something greater. So are you willing to sacrifice idols to place Christ first in your life? The third outcome of delighting in God's presence is you recognize your enormous debt. You recognize your enormous debt. Jesus is trying to teach this Pharisee something. He sees the heart of what this man, how he responds. And he says, I want to tell you a quick little story. And this is probably one of Jesus' shortest parables. I I don't know. I I didn't do the math to see what was Jesus' shortest parable. But Jesus liked to use parables to teach lessons. And this is a pretty short one. He says, let me, I want to say something to you. It starts in verse 40. and And the man answered, say it, teacher. He says, a certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii. A denarii is basically a day's wage. So think about that in your own context. Whatever you would make in a day, that would be 500 days of employment. And the other would owe 50 denarii. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? He put Simon on the spot. He liked to ask questions. And Simon answers, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And Jesus said, you have judged rightly. You see, the Pharisee standing there was a sinner just like the woman. But he didn't recognize his debt. He didn't recognize the sinfulness that he had in his own life. The woman came and sat and cried at Jesus' feet. Uh, Jesus responds, and you can read this in verse 44 and following, but he says, you didn't offer me water for my feet. You didn't welcome me with a kiss. 
You didn't even anoint my head with oil, and here she is anointing my feet with oil. He says the normal customs that you would afford to someone of value coming in your home, you didn't even give to me. But this woman hasn't stopped valuing me since she came in here. Because she recognized her enormous debt. I think there's a little jab at the end of verse 47. If you look at the last sentence there, but he who is forgiven little loves little. Who's Jesus talking about? The Pharisee there. He who is forgiven little loves little. Jesus says, you didn't give me value when I entered your home. You didn't see me as having worth even to afford some water, a kiss on the cheek. Yet this woman hasn't stopped doing these things. How much her love is being demonstrated because she recognizes her enormous debt. Peter talks about the debt that was paid in 1 Peter. It says, knowing that you were ransomed. What do we have to be ransomed from? Our sinfulness. From the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers. That sinful He says, you were ransomed not with perishable things, such as silver or or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. The ransom, the price that was paid, came at a cost. Because we had an enormous debt that needed to be paid. And so often we don't recognize that enormous debt that was paid off for us. And it was paid off with his blood. Later, Peter makes this comment, a couple chapters later. He says, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. And in other places of scripture, it talks about how we are given his righteousness. He didn't just take our righteousness away and upon himself. We're given his righteousness. But I had this thing dawn on me a couple weeks ago that's like, he didn't just give us his righteousness and not have any righteousness. Jesus Christ is still the ultimately righteous one. So he kept all of his righteousness but gave us righteousness so we would be fully righteous. Wrap your brain around that a couple times. That he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. There was a cost. There was a ransom that had to be paid because we had been taken by another. We had been enslaved by sinfulness. There was a ransom that needed to be paid. And Christ suffered. He made the payment so that we could be saved. Brad says this in his book, Gospel Treason. When you repent of the idols of your heart, when you stay constantly aware of just how much you've been forgiven, you love much. As you repent of idols of your heart and cultivate a lifestyle of repentance, you'll also have a lifestyle of love. So love will flow out of our lives because we recognize the enormous debt that has been paid for us. I want to take a moment this morning. Take a moment and just thank God for sending his son, for Jesus paying the price for our enormous debt. God, we thank you for sacrificing your son, for his willingness to humbly come and lay his life down that 
we may be saved. final outcome of delighting in God's presence is receiving God's mercy and grace. Receiving God's mercy and grace. Jesus says, verse 48, your sins are forgiven. What happens? He can't do that. What did he just say? Did he just say your sins are forgiven? He can't say his sins are forgiven. There's an uproar because Jesus says your sins are forgiven. Why? Because there's only one who can actually forgive sins. God, Jesus. But they didn't see him as God. So again, they begin to mumble among themselves. Who is this? Who even forgives sins? The end of verse 49 there. Jesus pours out mercy and grace to this woman. The one who could condemn, who was the ultimate judge, chooses to give mercy. Mercy is the withholding of punishment that is deserved. But he also chooses to extend grace which is the offering of something that is not deserved. Giving more. That God gives us forgiveness, redemption, and salvation. We don't deserve that. Not only do we not deserve to have our sins punished, which is mercy, but like I said earlier, he pours out his righteousness on us, which is his grace. I think those who don't recognize their debt also have a hard time receiving God's mercy and grace because they don't need it. It's not necessary. Brad says this, but the effect of setting your heart on God is that it makes you a very free person. It begins to relieve you of those idols in your life. We're given freedom to enjoy God's mercy and grace. And he says to the woman, he's not done with his mercy and grace. He said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. We read that verse and I don't think we catch the dynamics of it. Why? Because she wasn't in peace living in her sinfulness. She wasn't in peace being shackled by the weight of of what she was doing. That provided no peace. But now she has peace in her heart. No longer does she have to perform for her idols. No longer does she have to be shackled to her sins, but she has peace with God. And Paul declares that in Romans 5.1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace. We're now welcomed into the throne room as adopted children with full rights and privileges because we have peace with God. See, God's mercy and grace and peace should drive us to let go of our idols because we're sitting in his presence. But we recognize that our idols, they don't matter. It doesn't matter that we own a certain car or a house in a certain location. It doesn't matter what's in our wallet doesn't matter how comfortable or safe we feel. doesn't matter that I'm number one, sitting on my own throne. What matters is that we're sitting and delighting in God and who he is. As we sit and delight in God's presence, we'll begin to reflect his love back to him and others.
I talked about reflecting. As you're around other people, there's flies in here. It's buzzing my head right now. Um, I talked about how as you're around other people, you begin to reflect them. The same thing goes as we're sitting and delighting in who God is. The more we sit and delight in who he is, the more we're going to reflect who he is in our lives. And that's going to flow out of our lives through the love that we show to him and to others. We take the focus off of ourselves, take the focus off of our needs, our problems, laying down our pride, and we serve him sitting at his feet. Tim says this, as we look at him and rejoice in what he did for us, we will have the joy and hope necessary and the freedom from counterfeit gods, from those idols in our lives, to follow the call of God when times seem at their darkest and most difficult. Why? Because that's when we most often want to turn and serve our idols again because they'll bring us a little moment of comfort. But as we look at him and rejoice in what he did for us, we'll have joy, hope, and freedom from those idols. Would you pray with us? Father, we thank you for those that go before us, God, for those that help me learn about this. God, I pray that you would help all of us as we daily have to put ourselves in the position of that woman just at your feet, willing to just love you in whatever ways we see we can, with whatever we brought with us, the tears that we shed, our, our physical if it takes wiping our, your feet with our hair, God, whatever it takes. God, if we have to lay down something expensive like this woman had to with the ointment at your feet, help us to do that. Help us to give that to you and say, God, use whatever this is. I, I can't anymore because it's not bringing me the joy that I thought it would. Because I know that joy can only be found at your feet. God, I pray that you help us to delight in you. Teach us to do that. Cause our souls to yearn for that. So that we can be flourishing in you. Because we're like a tree planted by a stream of water. Because we're like a branch that's attached to the vine that's Jesus Christ. Because we're getting our nourishment from you. God, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs>
This is a blessing that Aaron gave to the people of Israel. It's from Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. May you go in peace this morning. God bless. Thank you.